Welcome to Beelzebub Cottage, Ireland. This is the home of Goddess Permaculture, a movement that has evolved from permaculture itself. And this is Beelzebub Cottage on the very first day that I saw it. I didn't do much to change the cottage. It still has the same roof and the same windows and the same door. I took off the porch and I built a wooden porch, which is more sustainable. And I put double glazed panels into the windows. I kept the windows because they were hardwood, probably from some bereft rainforest. This is the driveway looking down from the cottage again on the first day I saw it, which was around the 1st of May, which is why it's called Bealtaine Cottage. I put in a gravel driveway and um, planted, and I planted, and I planted, and I stopped counting at 1,100 trees. So you'll see the regeneration and the beauty of a woodland garden. But most importantly, the resilience of Mother Earth, that when you do make the effort to regenerate, that amazing things begin to happen. As you can see, I spent quite a few years strimming and mowing and keeping the rushes back while I planted. Hugely important. I didn't have a plan. I didn't have a plan. I simply looked at the cottage. I looked at Mother Earth and I thought, you poor, poor thing. I will plant you on this poor, north-facing land that the EU describes as marginal. Marginal? <laughs> oh, gosh, no. Just trying to get this camera set up because I want to show you what I'm doing. Let's see if I can do this. There we go. I think that's okay. So, this is one of the things that I do. A little bit of home sewing. And, um, what I'm doing today is I'm taking this throw, which I'd sort of packed away, I haven't really used it much, but it is a rather beautiful cotton and it has a little fringe on the end. And I thought I'd turn it into a curtain from my bedroom because um, I have a lovely muslin curtain in the bedroom, but of course it doesn't, doesn't give me complete privacy. So. This is very, very simple to sew because it's got lines already built into it. So I just have to follow the lines. So I'm putting this little seam in here and then leaving this top bit which will act as a kind of a frill. I won a scholarship to a grammar school and I was pretty good academically, in fact I liked the academic world but I really couldn't be bothered with anything that was in any way, shape or form reeking of domestication. So <laughs> I failed my, what was it called, um, domestic science O level. In fact, I was threatened by the teacher never to enter her kitchen again. So, I left school before I took my final exams and I went to London. And of course, couldn't really cook. I could sew. I used to do a lot of hand sewing and in fact um, I made a lot of clothes for myself but um, it was going to be 
quite a few years before I could afford to buy a sewing machine. In fact, in fact, it was going to be, oh, 15 years, I think, something like that. So most of my sewing was hand sewing. Now I have a little hand sewing machine as well. And uh, that's brilliant. In fact, my first sewing machine in London was an old treadle sewing machine, which is fantastic. I had that for years. There we go. That's that done. finished so I'm going to go and hang it up now. So I've hung the curtain but what it needs to have now is a little tie back like just a little a little tie back just to keep it um, back to allow the light in during the day. So I'm going to make a little tie back and then with the material left over, I'm going to make a new sort of covering panel for my very horrible windowsill. <laughs> I've told you for a very long time that um, with this cottage, the work that I've carried out is simply to make it cosy and comfortable. There's no major structural work. I would have liked major structural work because we all have our dreams, but, you know, like, for example, some decent windowsills. This is just like a slab of concrete. <laughs> but you just make the most of things. So I'm going to set about and make a little tie back with the other. I think there's about a quarter of the throw left. You can see the little frills at the top there. Um, and then make a little panel to put on the window ledge. So I've finished this little project. In all it's taken me about an hour in total. So I've made the little, um, let's see if you can see it, see it's got the little fringe on it. So I've made the little um, cloth for the window ledge, for the windowsill, and that covers all the um, not so nice bits. <laughs> And um, I've used part of the little fringy hem on the throw to make this little tie back. And if you can see here, I've made these little, little double up things, just to, little hooks. And I've screwed in a rather large cup hook, well, quite an ornate one. I thought that looked quite nice. So there we go. That's my new window dressing. There we go. So I think you'll agree with me that looks quite passable. Gives it a nice clean summery edge. What do you think Jack? you think is my hammer and nail always good to have a hammer and nail you know when you're putting a, a big hook into a hardwood if you hammer a nail kind of about a little bit in so say about that much in and then that gives you something to grip the screw of the cup hook or, or the hook onto so kind of matches my porch on the outside doesn't it That makes better use of that throw. Now I think I've got another throw to match that. So I might make some pillowcases for the bed. The evening sunlight on the trees. Isn't it beautiful? 
I've just brought Jack back from a very long walk. We've done, well, it's a, I say a very long walk, it's about two miles. <sighs> He's had a treat. I'm about to have a cup of tea. But I just came out the back to pot up two little seedling, two little tiny seedling little trees. See these two here, look. Because I picked them up on my walk. And you've got to pot them up immediately, you know, otherwise they die. And I seen the sunlight, the evening sun on the trees, and I just thought, oh, this is just too beautiful to let go. I've got to capture this on film. I don't know if you can see right, right in the background there, the sun on the ash trees. Well, this is Tuesday. Um, not too sure of the date. There's been a little bit of rain. Not too much. Probably just enough. <laughs> Probably just enough to tide me over for the next, I don't know, four to seven days. It depends how hot it gets. But anyway, I think the rain is back. I think there's a kind of a rebalance in the weather systems. So that's back. And what it has done is freshened up the garden immensely. So there's lots and lots of flowers coming out. The Jacob's Ladder, the Aquilegia, the Clematis, the London Pride and the Chives. Some beautiful roses over in the tunnel. The Oxide Daisy is about to open up and give off their best. I've been potting up lots of ferns. I've been collecting little seedling, little tiny little seedling trees on my walks. So I've got um, yew and um, uh, some tiny ferns, wild garlic. Um, some of the yew actually were not too bad of a size, a longer root, so I've put them into these tins, which are lovely because they do weather down, let me just turn this around, they do weather down beautifully and you just punch a few holes in the bottom, you know, with a, a nail and a hammer and away you go, so I'm hoping that they'll take. And my willow, I've actually got a weeping willow tree and I must just show you. There's the original cutting there, which has now died. The root stayed alive, which is the main thing. And so this beautiful willow tree has emerged from the root. And you can see down there, there's some little tiny bits, tiny little bits of red. There might be a few more stems arise, but I think, I think it just might be just this one stem, which is perfect in terms of growing a willow tree. So, so not a willow tree, a weeping willow tree. So that's going to be my very first weeping willow tree here at Pialtona Cottage. And again, I stole it. I'm a terrible thief. I stole it. It was a cutting that I stole, unashamedly <coughs> thieved. <coughs> I'm a robber. <laughs> um, some beautiful roses out here on the veranda as well. Look at this. They're gorgeous. And I even got some coming out on this side. Look at that. And the poppies getting ready to open up. And the bird song, just glorious, just continues all the time. I read in a comment some time ago that Herb Robert was an absolute weed and it was difficult to get rid of and horrible and <laughs> anything negative that could be said about Herb Robert was in that comment. I think it's beautiful. 
I think it's absolutely beautiful. The colours are amazing. Look at these beautiful colours. And it is the easiest thing to pull up because you get a mass of Herb Robert coming from one tiny little root stem. So bring it on. I adore you, Herb Robert. I've been adding little plants to my woodland edge, my woodland edge garden. And I have these incredibly fancy ideas of having a stumpery. <laughs> now, if anyone wants to see the most magnificent stumpery, um, there's a video uh, all about Highgrove House, which is Prince Charles's country dwelling. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful gardens. Uh, just the most beautiful gardens I've ever seen. Um, and in the gardens, he has designed a stumpery, and it is absolutely fantastic. Um, the video is about, I think it's about, um, it's about an hour in length. But anyway, it's all about High Grove House. And I think it is when Alan Titchmarsh visited. But anyway, it's up on YouTube. Seek it out. And have a look at that stumpery and tell me what you think. <laughs> this is the darkness of summer. And you know, you know what grows out of the darkness? Life. Because it reaches towards the light. You see, it reaches up towards the light. But down in the kind of depths, you have this beautiful darkness, this beautiful shade. And it's rich. It's rich in colour and it's rich in plants and it's rich in all kinds of organic life. And look at this. Honesty. Lunaria. Isn't that wonderful? And here you can peep through, just peep through the darkness into the light and my woodland edge. I love this time of the year. Not only are there kilos and kilos and kilos and kilos of black currants everywhere here at Bealtaine, but there's going to be tons, <laughs> tons of apples. Isn't this incredible? Look, this is just one tree. Just one tree. There's black currants underneath it. I love the way these primulas, once they start to grow and they open up, they just keep growing. <laughs> wreath after wreath of beautiful pink flowers. Gorgeous. This is in one of the orchards. Now someone asked me, I think it was on Facebook recently, how many how many apple how, how many fruit trees I think it was. It could have been apple trees, but anyway, basically how many fruit trees have you got? Have you planted? I stopped counting at 38. It did go up over 40, but I really have just stopped counting. Because it seems to be almost irrelevant. Um, I've got lots. <laughs> I've got as much as I need and a wee bit more. Always plant that wee bit more for, for life. Listen to the life all around us, look. The life is all around us. If you don't plant for that life, you've just been a completely useless gardener. <laughs> See the size of this Cotoneaster now? It's turned into an absolute giant. It's amazing. I think I've only planted it like no more than two years ago. May have, it may have even been last year, I can't remember. But it's grown amazingly well. 
And it's yet another variety from all the others that I have here. It was only half the size of that little unicorn's horn. And now, it's gigantic. <laughs> Do you remember the roses with the green fly? And I said, oh, we'll just leave that green fly. That'll be okay. There's still little bits of it there, look. But that's, be that's providing food for other little insects. Has it stopped the roses? Not at all. <laughs> Looks like daisies have just opened up here in the tunnel because it's a little bit warmer in here. They're beautiful, aren't they beautiful? And the little birds are beginning to eat little bits of the petals. Look at that. There's a little, a little butterfly down there. Looks like a little cabbage white. There's always just a little weedy corner and it's now become a little miniature garden. There's some seed heads of the Lunaria and there's a little bee on the Aquilegia. Some of the bees are ever so tiny. Deirdre, I've got to say a big thank you again. You are a wonderful lady. You're always sending me interesting books. So this is your latest book that you've sent me. Poems to Fall in Love With. I thank you for thinking of me. There are times when I don't get the chance to thank someone. Or I make it very... Very small, it's a very small thank you that sometimes can be overlooked. But I've got this beautiful book. You see, it was in my bookshelf in the sitting room and I pulled it out last night to read it. And I remembered then this beautiful person who sent it to me. And it was a birthday present and it's from Megan Primrose. And what is beautiful about this as well is that her father... Um, Mike Stringer Mike Stringer did all the illustrations for it and also enclosed these beautiful cards for me so I want to say a big thank you Megan, I'm so enjoying the book and look your father Michael has signed it for me so thank you So here I am, just sitting down now, at the top of the driveway, feeling a wee bit listless today, don't know why. I think it could be because I have been working rather hard over recent weeks. Sometimes, you know, it catches up on you. Well, invariably it does. <laughs> but sometimes you're fast asleep in bed and you don't notice. But anyway... Yeah, since early morning I felt quite listless. I probably need just to um, take a few days off. Well, it's virtually impossible. I was driving back from the Bluebell Woods last night, after you know, with Jack, because I'd taken him down there for a walk, because he loves it so much. And an orange light came on in my car on the dashboard. So I've rung up um, the garage over in Ballyfarnan. It's um, it's something's something's gone wrong in the engine. It's basically a a warning light, you know, to tell me to get up to the garage. Oh, I feel too. I f actually feel too tired to be taking it anywhere. So I might leave it till tomorrow. Give Frank a ring and tell him I'll be over tomorrow sometime with it. I probably just need to 
go to bed with a book. I think sometimes as well, you know, the, the internet can be very debilitating. There's so much and there's so much negativity and I don't go looking for negativity. I don't think any of us do. But sometimes it kind of pops up, you know, it pops up under a different name or, or it, it, it pops up with, with such a name that, that you're drawn into it and you want to know more. And that in itself can be quite, I won't say depressing, because there's some real things in this world that can depress us, you know, such as cruelty to animals and cruelty to other human beings, and especially children. So I won't say that it's depressing, but it does, it does kind of bring you into a, a, a space of desolation. Maybe that would be a good term to use to describe it. A place of desolation, where one feels quite desolate, you know, it's kind of a giving up place. Oh, there's the sun come out, look at that, you see, look. Mother Earth has heard me and she said, oh, Colette, I'm going to send you a bit of sun. Pick yourself up. <laughs> The sun does make me smile and make me laugh. I mean, I must say, although I'm not a sun worshipper, I don't ever sit out and sunbathe. But I think as well now, to be perfectly reasonable about this, your body um, is on a cycle. It's on, I mean, it doesn't matter what age you are, your body is on a cycle. And uh, that cycle is called the biorhythms. And the biorhythms kind of go in waves, you know, up and down and up and down. Much like the cycles in all other forms of life, whether it's the sun cycles or the moon cycles or the earth cycles, we are also sort of betrothed to those cycles. And It's a good thing to just think of that and be aware of them. And when you hit the lowest part of the cycle, nurture yourself a little bit more. I mean, <laughs> do you know what I would really love now? I'd really love some chocolate. <laughs> oh, a chocolate or a cake. A nice cake with a cup of tea, something sweet. That's always a great pick-me-up. Incredibly naughty. Oh, what am I to do? And I haven't got any cake. And I haven't got any bickies. And I haven't got any sweets. In fact, there's more treats for Jack in that cottage than what there is for me. Look, he's wagging his tail. He's saying, oh, oh, I recognise that word, mum. So there we go. I think I'll get into the cottage now and load up this video. Because it'll probably take me... Oh, did you, see, did you see that little bird go into the bird box? Oh my word. In it went... There it... Oh, look at that. It's come out again. Oh, how beautiful. Blessed little creature. Oh, how beautiful. Where there's life, there's hope. Yes, isn't that right, Jack? As I often say to you, Jack, I bet you had a lovely mummy. I bet she was just the best. And she'd be very proud to see you now. <laughs> oh, a little... A little anecdote, actually, before I go. I was listening to the radio this morning and there was a young chap on there who had been taken ill with the coronavirus and brought into one of the 
Dublin hospitals. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, I mean, he he was a fit, healthy young man, but he just took a bit of a downturn with the virus. Anyway, he was in the hospital for a total of, I think, five days or something, and he came out, he was fine afterwards. But what made me laugh was that he said, um, he said, I really want to thank all the nurses. He said, uh, he said, as soon as I, as soon as I was admitted into the hospital and I was on the ward, I was in the bed, he said there was a couple of nurses came along and they said to me, they said, well now, where are your mammy now? <laughs> and within that little, little kind of half loving statement was, you'll do as you're told. <laughs> I just thought that was just so Irish. It was just such an Irish thing, you know. It's the kind of thing to expect in an Irish hospital. A nurse to come along and say, I'm your mummy now. Because <laughs> here in Ireland, you know, um, the boys especially, and the men right through until the day their mother dies, <laughs> do as they're told by their mummy. <sighs> oh, now, I feel a bit better now. Blessings to you all, my friends. All Bealtaine Cottage books are printed here in Ireland, not offshored or uploaded to Amazon or any other corporation. They're printed in Ireland and they're posted from Ireland. And I do all the work here myself. This is best practice permaculture. This is not being a hypocrite and saying I practice permaculture and then have my books printed and delivered by Amazon. It's truly local, 100%.